Now, I'm pleased to introduce our May Conservative Women's Network panelist and moderator, who will discuss a hot topic in today's American society, the gender wage gap. Our panel moderator is Romina Boccaccia. <laughs> I did it right. Did that good <laughs> a leading fiscal and economic expert at the Heritage Foundation. She focuses on government spending, debt, and workforce policy. As I said, she's director of the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget, and she often advises members of Congress and their staffs on fiscal policy issues. She's widely published, quoted in newspapers, magazines, and digital outlets. She received her master's degree in economics from George Mason University and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in economics from Mason also with a concentration in data analysis. She's originally from Augsburg, Germany and uh, lives in Clinton, Maryland. And she's spoken before at Conservative Women's Network. In fact, we had a panel on economics maybe a year or so ago. She did such a wonderful, clear explanation of basic economic principles that we've asked her to speak at a summer event we're having, Clear Booth Loose, at Capitol Hill Club for some of our leaders and summer interns from around town. Also on our panel is Vanessa Brown Calder, a senior policy advisor at the United States Congress Joint Economic Committee. She's also served as a policy analyst at Cato Institute, where she focused on social welfare, housing, and urban policy. And she's also been published in the Wall Street Journal, CNN.com, National Review Online, and Real Clear Health. She's been featured in radio and television programming and policy briefings on Capitol Hill. Previously, Vanessa was a graduate fellow in welfare studies here at the Heritage Foundation, where she analyzed federal housing programs. And she has a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and a Bachelor of Science in Urban Planning from University of Utah, where she graduated summa cum laude. Next is Rachel Gressler, a, a research fellow also at the Heritage Foundation's Grover M. Herman Center for Federal Budget, where she focuses on retirement and labor policies such as Social Security, disability insurance, pensions, and worker compensation. Her work focuses on policies that promote economic growth, individual freedom, and well-being. Rachel's writing and research includes analysis of reforms to Social Security and its disability insurance program with the goal of returning them to their original focus of poverty prevention and reducing the government's control over retirement savings. Before joining Heritage in 2013, Rachel was a senior economist on the staff of the Joint Economic Committee of Congress for seven years. Rachel completed her graduate studies at Georgetown University where she earned master's degrees in both economics and public policy and holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Mary Washington. She grew up in a small town in western New York, Jamestown, and currently resides in Bethesda with her husband and six children. And fourth on our panel is Patrice Lee Onwuka, a senior policy analyst, analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. Prior to joining IWF, she served as National Spokeswoman and Communications Director at Generation Opportunity and also worked at the Philanthropy Roundtable and the Fund for American Studies in policy and media roles. She also held consulting roles as a speechwriter for United Nations spokesman and a manager for student travel programs to South Africa. She was born in the Caribbean immigrated with her family to Boston when she was three, uh, where she grew up and completed her education. And she earned, earned her bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Tufts and a master's degree in international relations from Boston's Boston College. And we are in for a great discussion. The fairy tale from the left is that similarly situated professional men, professional women, with that situation, women are paid dramatically less than their male counterparts. Well, we're gonna hear a little something about that. Please join me in welcoming all of our CWN speakers today. Do women earn less than men for doing the exact same work? That's the question we're trying to address here today. And I want to ask all of you to pull up a website 
um, called Slido, S-L-I dot D-O. And I have just um, a quick polling question uh, for you. If you put in hashtag earn, hashtag earn at Slido, and it will pull up our event today on the gender wage gap. And there's just one quick question, which is, do you believe women are paid less than men for the, doing the exact same work? And um, we just had the website pull up on the screens. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> ladies, you all are professional women working in the workplace. Tell me, do women get paid less than men for doing the same work? What is this gender wage gap all about? So I can jump in with an answer to just this first question. Before I begin, I should probably say that I'm here on behalf of myself. I don't represent the Joint Economic Committee's views. I'm here representing my own personal views. So what is the gender wage gap? Um, this is something that receives a lot of attention and continues to do so. Probably some of you saw um, Senator Harris's proposal yesterday, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. The gender wage gap is basically the 20% gap that results when you line up men on an income distribution of workers, and then you line up women on another income distribution, and you just simply pluck out the middle worker from each distribution, and you compare those two. And what you find when you compare those two is that that median man is earning about 20% more than that median woman is on that other income distribution. But of course, these men and women also differ on a variety of different characteristics. It's not just that the man is making more money, it might also be that the man lives in a different location, that he has a different number of years of experience, that he has a different educational background. There are all sorts of different ways that this man and woman can vary. And so that's kind of what the gender pay gap looks at, and I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more why that may be a little problem. And I'll just jump in and say that, yes, there is a gap if you're just talking about the pay, but it's really a choice gap if you start analyzing why is there a difference in these average amounts that men and women make. And about half of that gap is simply due to the hours. Men tend to work more hours than women do. There are a lot of other um, things that explain it, the occupations that they choose. Women tend to choose more service-oriented jobs than men. And then there are some things that aren't measurable, such as preferring a more flexible work schedule or a different benefits package that has a different value to it. Um, some studies have attempted to make a more apples to apples comparison and not just pick the median of each. And those studies have reduced the pay gap um, from 20 cents to more about 2 cents, according to a recent payscale.com study. Uh, these ladies touched on a lot of them. I left outside, actually, this really nifty, almost bookmark, but there's a longer version that just lays out some of these these controlling factors that they laid out. Um, hours worked, I'll just highlight that. Full-time men work 8.3 hours per day on average, compared to 7.8 hours that women work. So as you can imagine, if you're putting in fewer hours as a woman compared to a man, for many different reasons, not necessarily bad reasons, but in the aggregate, it's going to have an impact on overall earnings. Um, excuse me. So when you control for just hours alone, the pay gap shrinks to 11%. And then you layer on that some of these other factors that were noted. An interesting one is the dangerousness of jobs. How many people have watched dirty jobs? Uh, and imagine how many women are, are actually out there on oil rigs every day. Those, are, those carry higher pay because they're more dangerous. But So there are lots of trade-offs, as everyone mentioned. I'll just highlight that a lot of what we hear is that uh, this 20% this gap is due to gender discrimination. There is absolutely no no evidence that supports that claim. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, when they actually calculate uh, the, the, the gender pay gap every year, they once they layer on these controlling factors, finds that it shrinks to, as you, as you mentioned, probably two cents, maybe five cents at most. And even then, the BLS is not willing to chalk that up to, to gender discrimination. The left, unfortunately, likes to paint that as, paint it as all gender discrimination. And I think that's where we have to take back the narrative to say, you know what? There's, men and women earn differently. It's because of the choices that they make. And isn't it a wonderful thing that as a woman, we can choose what we want to study, choose the careers that make sense, choose the types of flexibility and the pay that makes sense for the different stages of our life. And that has an impact in the aggregate, but it doesn't mean it's negative on the individual level. This is a <clears throat> very educated audience. We had uh, 40 participants in this multiple choice uh, poll. Do you believe women are paid less than men for doing the exact same work? And 60% uh, said no. 
Um, so that's, that's interesting. I just opened up another uh, poll on Slido. Um, and that one uh, will result in a word, word cloud. And the question is, uh, what idea drove your answer to whether women get paid more than men for doing the same work? Um, just so we can get a little more insight into what made you uh, provide that answer. So um, Patrice, you mentioned choices and how wonderful it is that we have choices and we should celebrate that. Um, I want to uh, go a little bit more in depth into what exactly are those choices that we see women and men make and how does that impact pay on an individual level and then also on the an aggregate level. Because when we look at the gender wage gap, and you, you described it very well, it really is an aggregate statistic that takes all women and all men, and then like you said, pulls out that median woman and men, and says, okay, men um, out earn women if you look at all women and men. You mentioned one factor, hours. What are some of the key factors that explain the gender wage gap and, um, and, and the choices that, that men and women make. Let me start with um, some fun stuff, uh, for, particularly pertinent to the age of uh, the, our audience today, college majors. Uh, so Glassdoor in 2017 looked at the college majors for men and women. And this is a top line, I'll just give you that. Many college majors tend to lead to higher paying uh, uh, roles in tech and engineering, and those tend to be male dominated, not surprising. While majors that lead to lower paying roles in social sciences and liberal arts tend to be female dominated. Now, I did get a, 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 my undergrad in political science and economics, so maybe I straddle the fence really nicely there. Um, but it's not surprising. When you see you know, mechanical engineering, 89% male. Civil engineering, 83% male. Let's skip to the female side. Uh, social work, can you guess, uh, lower or higher than 80% female? Higher. Yes, you're absolutely right, 85%. Healthcare administration, 84% female. Anthropology, lower or higher than 60% female? Than 70% female. Yep, than 80% female. <laughs> There you go. So it, it tells you that women, young women, tend to be drawn to different types of, of studies. That's not a bad thing. Uh, some, have, some have called them the caring uh, majors, uh, social work, education, nursing, things like that. It's great if that's naturally where your inclination is, where your passion is, where your desire is. Now we just have to recognize that the labor, that the, the, the economy values that differently than, say, an a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer. Uh, I'm not going to get into a value judgment bet between the two, but it's recognizing that as women and as men, we have to make a decision for what makes sense for us. Um, and so when we look at kind of the wage gap and, and that aggregate, uh, considering the aggregate, if you're a, going into college and you're focusing on a major that's not going to be as high paying when you come out, yeah, you're going to be struggling with student loan debt and you may struggle to pay that off. And so how do we decide what, what works for us? Uh, and and as, as a woman, hey, maybe we start to think if I want to be a social worker, maybe I'll be driving Uber on the side. Something to think about. Yeah, um, I saw a study recently, <clears throat> happy to share with anybody who's interested, that looked at whether uh, men are more capable of harder subjects, engineering and math, mm -hmm. than women, or whether other factors account for the difference we see in choices. And it found, no, <clears throat> women are just as capable uh, than men, um, but um, women um, have a preference for um, meaning mm -hmm. through their work, overcompensation, they value that more highly, which is one of the reasons that drives them towards the caring professions. Yeah. They can make an impact in people's lives. That level of fulfillment. And I'll just yeah. add, we'll probably get to it later, but when you look at uh, uh, the wage gap for black women, for Hispanic women, those factors really begin to play a role. I think that study might be called, does Rosie like riveting or something like that? I saw this NBR study recently. Um, it was probably actually published more like a year, year and a half ago. And it looked at that very same thing, and the authors kind of came to the conclusion that women may prioritize some qualitative aspects of work over some of the sort of quantitative just compensation aspects of work. And it's that they actually maybe don't prefer to do some of these higher paying jobs because the work environments are actually not very pleasant in some higher paying jobs. And those higher paying jobs are probably things like, you know, in some cases, maybe working on an oil rig, maybe it's just actually sitting at your desk all day talking to no one being an engineer. But either way, maybe those things aren't as pleasant and people prioritize differently, which um, I think is 
totally fair and acceptable. And on that, um, Claudia Golden has done some research to show that at particularly demanding jobs in terms of time intensity, such as lawyers and doctors, there are kind of supernatural returns there. And so it's people who need to be on call all the time. And so it's more than the wage gap that you would expect because they're having to pay a significant premium and those fields tend to be dominated more by men. And I think they're trying to get more women into the fields, but the reality is, is that women, particularly if they are mothers, do not want to be in those positions where they have to be working 12 plus hours a day. And so on that, the gap is really more of a parenthood gap, motherhood versus fatherhood. And you know, stereotypical as it is, men and women respond differently to having a child. Women tend to want to spend more time at home and work fewer hours, and men tend to want to spend more time providing financially for their families. And that's just a choice that men and women make and not something that we should try to force upon them to change that. I think that that's a key um, point here, which is that there's been some really interesting research recently, again, in the last year or two, um, that's been focused on Denmark. Um, there was a study on that used Danish administrative data, and um, using this Danish administrative data, they were able to see that actually female er earnings tracked male earnings until the point of the first child. So at that point, that's where you saw that actually earnings dropped off as well as all sorts of other things, labor force participation, hours worked, wage rates, they all fell at that same point. So it was that as if there was actually no pay gap until you came to the point where the family, um, you know, had a, a child added to their crew and they had to actually change behaviors in order to fulfill their kind of commitments and obligations to take care of that child. And many of those obligations fell to and were absorbed by women. If you look at the chart, men actually go along kind of consistently. They're not, their hours worked, their labor force participation, their earnings are not actually impacted by that first child's birth. So I guess something that I would just in interject into the conversation to play a little bit of devil's advocate here is um, I think on, on the progressive left a lot of times there's a lot of focus on the labor supply, like the labor force participation, issues that are happening, discrimination issues that are happening within the workplace walls. And actually, if you want to rage against anything and you want to be upset about anything, then what you should really direct your rage towards is the way that men and women absorb work um, sort of domestic labor differently. And those are decisions that are actually being made privately, right? But there are certainly cultural reasons, potentially, why men and women absorb those different responsibilities in different ways. And so I think that um, if, if people were being really fair about the wage gap, they would actually focus on that issue and say, well, you know, are there ways that we could talk to women about, I don't know, their career potential or the way that we want them to be working after they have children or find ways to actually make it more flexible, the workplace, in ways that would actually accommodate women with children so they can stay engaged at higher levels. But oftentimes, um, like with this proposal that Senator Harris had come out with yesterday, um, the focus is really, again, on discrimination in the workplace. And that's just not supported by what we see in the social science literature. And so it feels very disingenuous. Well, and I think what you're raising are issues like uh, paid family leave in child care. And I think it's interesting on the paid family leave front, uh, we're at a remarkable time where it's not just uh, the, the left that's talking about paid leave, but we have proposals coming from the right, uh, center right, about paid leave. Um, you know, our organization, the Independent Women's Forum, we worked, uh, one of our policy analysts came up with the idea of saying, why can't you, if you pay into Social Security, 6.2% of your pay and your employer matches that with another 6.2%, you're paying that over the course of your, your career. Um, but if you're a young person, you want to start a family, that's when you need the money most, not necessarily when you're at retirement and you've already put excuse me, a lot of money into the system, but you have already have your 401k. So why can't you kind of take out, borrow some of your Social Security earnings, and then delay your Social Security re re retirement benefits later on. Uh, interesting idea. I'm sure there's there's certainly some disagreement uh, for different folks, different reasons. There are other proposals coming from the right as well. But 
to get to the point about how do we uh, change norms when it comes to parenting and whether moms and dads stay at home, whether the mom goes out to work or the dad stays at home. I think that's how you, you, you need to start to address some of these issues around, well, why do, why do women tend to stay at, stay at home versus, uh, versus dads? Childcare is another huge issue. I'm learning that firsthand myself about the cost of raising a child. Uh, and so, you know, when we have these discussions about paid leave and, and uh, Kamala Harris's bill, interestingly, it's uh, funding her. The, the funding source uh, is sh pretty much shaking down corporations to be able to fund something like a, a paid leave bill. Uh, again, Let's talk it's gonna, a little bit. Yeah. We've heard a couple times now this proposal mentioned. Um, would either, would any of you like to just briefly talk about what Kamala Harris is proposing to do there? It's basically just a pay transparency bill. And um, so the idea is that government would need to certify, which is part of the bill, every couple of years, private companies' gender wage gaps, and basically confirm that those gender wage gaps were not a result of discrimination. Now, how exactly they have access to the information, or even the companies have access to the information in order to prove that, um, it's hard to know exactly how that would really work. But if, if they're not in compliance, then the idea under the Kamala Harris plan is that they would be fined. So 1% of their profits would be fined and penalized as a result of every additional 1% of unexplained pay gap. Um, so obviously that's problematic for many of the reasons that we've talked about. One thing is that pay transparency doesn't seem to be the actual legitimate issue that's driving the gender wage gap, even if you buy into the gender wage gap at all. Um, and another thing is that the gender wage gap, in my view, is just not particularly good data science to begin with. And so building any type of proposal uh, uh, you know, on that as the foundation is problematic. Rachel, you've been doing a lot of work on the Paycheck Fairness Act, which also had a transparency requirement. Um, if we're just asking employers to show us how they're paying people, and if they're not discriminating, you know, they're not bad employers, there might be some bad ones out there, but let's say the majority of employers do want to pay women and men fairly. What's the problem with transparency? Well, there is a privacy issue because you're asking employers to reveal their employees' names, their gender, their race, and their salary. Um, but that's just for starters. The issue here at play is just the fear of lawsuits and who is better poised to determine what to pay their employees. Is it the employer themselves or is it the government? Um, Denmark actually implemented a similar law to that provision that's contained in the Paycheck Fairness Act that just required companies over, with over 35 employees to start reporting their pay. Um, what happened is they did find a slight reduction in the pay gap for those particular companies. It dropped by two percentage points, but it didn't help women. It actually hurt them and it hurt men as well. And so overall, they reduced their total pay by 2.8 percent. Hmm. Productivity went down for all the companies. And in the end, everybody was worse off, women, men, and the companies. So this is not something that's going to help. And it was interesting to bring up um, having to report your pay and the government being the one that's going to decide, do you have a legitimate pay gap or not? Um, so there was a lawsuit by the Department of Labor against Google. First, they were fighting whether or not they actually had to reveal this private information. Um, they ended up having to hand over some information to the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor said, we think you have a legitimate pay gap here. We're going to be looking into this. Well, Google has been doing its own analysis, and as a data analysis company, I think it's pretty well equipped to be doing this properly. And so it set aside millions of dollars saying, hey, if we have a pay gap, we want to correct it. We're going to use these funds to do it. Well, their analysis revealed that they were overpaying women compared to men, and so the majority of the money meant to men. Um, <laughs> so they found the total opposite from what the Department of Labor found. And the question is really just, who do we want deciding pay scales? Is it your own personal manager who knows what you've done on a day-to-day -day basis, or do you want judges and politicians deciding what your pay should be? I also just want to jump back in here and just mention something going back to Patrice's comment um, and setting aside the Social Security paid family leave kind of issue and bill and just talking about paid leave more broadly and whether or not paid leave can be linked to gender pay gaps and whether or not it can close gender pay gaps. I think that that's kind of something that maybe was like a little bit of subtext. Um, 
one of the really interesting things about this Danish administrative data study that I mentioned before is that actually Denmark does have so much social spending that is supposed to support women being highly engaged in the labor force um, after birth and after, you know, regardless the number of children, you get all sorts of lengthy parental leaves, both for men and for women, and you also have access to universal child care and other social supports as well. And um, what's interesting is that even with all of those supportive policies, you still have this big child-based earnings gap, which only opens up again after that first child is born. Um, so I just, I guess for myself, I'm a little hesitant to link reducing the gender pay gap with some of these other social policies, which, um, you know, it may be true that some of those things have arguments on their own merit and they stand alone, but I don't think that they necessarily open or that they close close that gender pay gap in the way that people would like them to. But people talk about it that way uh, all the time. And if you actually look at the child earnings gap that opens up in Denmark and you compare it to the, to the one in the US, for instance, um, and you compare it to other countries that also have lengthy paid leaves and universal child care and these other social supports, the US seems to be kind of just in the middle. It doesn't seem to be that um, it's the worst, uh, it's not the best, um, but they're all actually pretty close. On that issue of paid family leave here, it can kind of go in opposite directions. If you have a government mandated program and the government is deciding how long people are allowed to take off, whether or not they qualify for these benefits, it's the reverse and it ends up hurting women. And this is what has happened with really generous leave policies in Europe and in Canada is that it not only hurts their initial opportunity to get in the door, because if you are sitting there and hiring and you have the choice between a 25 year old man and a 25 year old woman, otherwise equal um, capabilities, it's smarter to hire the man because he has less um, of a likelihood of going out on leave in the future. And so you're gonna lead to more discrimination. And then once women are in the jobs, less opportunity for advancement. Because if you're going to, if you think that they're gonna take leave or you know they're going to, you're not gonna promote them to a management position if they're going to be taking lengthy leaves, which in Europe is you know, roughly a year for having a child. On the other hand, if employers and employees on their own accord are able to negotiate the terms of any type of paid family leave agreement, then you know that the employer has chosen to make that agreement on their own terms and that it's worth it to them. They have basically said, hey, we think that we want paid family leave because we want to keep women and men in the workforce. We don't want to have to hire new employees to retrain them if they have to leave and quit their job for a medical reason. So they've already decided it's worth it and they know that it is. And when it happens on their terms, and that can actually tend to close the gap because you've made access to that leave more available and women do tend to stay in the workforce longer if they have access to that leave. Just for the <clears throat> young women of childbearing age in the room, uh, we do see the wage gap disappear for women in their 50s as they come out of that time period. But it's important to understand that um, your supervisor, your employer, when you show up for an interview, there are lots of questions they're not allowed to ask you or um, they are liable potentially for discrimination. And that includes um, whether you're married, whether you have children, whether you're planning to have children. Those are all factors that uh, employers are not allowed to consider. Um, however, um, employers will consider them even if they're not allowed to ask you about them. So as a woman, I just want you to know you have all the power in those negotiations and um, you can you can use that information asymmetry if you will you knowing what your plans are what your needs are whether you want to be uh, focusing on your career whether you want to balance family and career um, what kind of life you envision for yourself and negotiate the package that will work best for you because in the absence of you volunteering um, this information, if that is to your benefit, this is a judgment call that you need to make, um, you might find um, that you're being overlooked for promotion opportunities um, because there might be some assumptions about what your plans might be. And I just mentioned that because I had personal experience with this when I, um, I, was, um, I, was, I was hired, I was already married and I just bought a home. I send a lot of strong signals um, that weren't necessarily true for me, but um, that could be uh, misinterpreted. And even um, 
with the best intentions, your supervisor may have the best intentions and not want to put too much stress on you and maybe thinking ahead of time, you might want a flexible work environment. Maybe you're thinking about starting a family or already in the process of it. And that was that's happened to me. And that was absolutely not was that what I was planning to do. Um, and I realized that over time um, that that was happening. And it wasn't discrimination in the sense of, oh, you're a woman, you're going to have a family, um, so I'm going to pay you less. The problem was there was an information problem it was a another woman actually thinking oh I remember when I had my first child and I wanted you know less less pressure and so I'm gonna protect my my, my employee here trying to make me happy um, so just know they're not allowed to ask you they're not allowed to initiate that conversation you have all the power so negotiate the package that will make you happy Ramina how did you address that particular issue I remember you talking about this a little bit more Yes, so once I realized what was happening, um, for my first reaction was I got very mad. I was upset. I went home to my husband and complained. I can't believe this is happening. I'm being discriminated against. <laughs> and we talked about it and realized that maybe there were other intentions behind it. And I, I set up a, a meeting with my supervisor, and we, we met over lunch. And um, I, I brought it up and said, here's what I think is happening. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I really, I want to get that promotion. I want to um, get more responsibility. Um, why is this not happening? What do I have to do to position myself in that way? And by the way, I am not trying to get pregnant right now. So in case that's a concern at all. <laughs> and um, we, were, we were able to work it out. But it was, it was just, it's just good to know that they're not allowed to ask you, so if that's important to you and your career and what you're trying to do, you might you might want to negotiate on your own behalf. I think that's a really important point that Romina is making, which is that although this gender pay gap doesn't exist the way that it's talked about, it's certainly true that in some cases, women probably face discriminatory circumstances and that that might happen on sort of an individual basis. It's not the trend. It's not that it's happening happening broadly across the economy, and that's the way that it's described a lot of times when you read these stories. But it's certainly possible, just like in some cases, I don't know, I think it's probably possible that men could be discriminated against by their employer as well. So um, certainly, if that is something that you feel like is happening to you, I know when we had a Ladies of Liberty Alliance event, one of the interns in the room said, my boss always just asks me to get coffee, and he asks the male intern to do like the more exciting research work, and I really don't like this dynamic. So if that's something that is happening to you, then what you should do is actually exactly what Romina did, is, which is address it directly. I think that's the first step. And then if that doesn't work, then you should probably leave because there are employers, lots of employers that won't treat you that way. And that's, I think, a, a, it's a great when you have a strong economy and a tight jobs market where you are empowered as a young person or as a woman uh, to be able to leave if you're not able to negotiate something better and find uh, you know better opportunities. Can I just shift and talk just a little bit, I think, about another layer of discrimination that tends to be added on to the equal pay, which is uh, race. Um, and so we often hear that there's the equal pay day in April, but then there's the black women's equal pay day, and I think it was May of this year, and I think Hispanic equal pay day was uh, the beginning of June, or will be in the beginning of June. And so what tends to happen is you start with the gender discrimination, and then you're adding uh, some of these groups on the left tend to add uh, race uh, as another layer of uh, victimization, honestly. Uh, I've tried to dig and find out how they get to those numbers. And very often, you are comparing black women, uh, uh, median black women, with white males. Uh, so sorry, white males in the audience, you apparently are the, are, are the, the source of all social evils in our, in our nation right now. Um, and just to quote some of the, uh, the statistics I found, uh, black women earn 65% of what white males uh, earn in, in terms of earnings. But interestingly, when you compare black women to black men, which makes much more sense, uh, it's about 89 cents. Now, that's just the median earnings. And then when you layer on all of those other controlling factors, black women probably out-earn black men. Uh, similarly, Hispanic women uh, earn, what is, where is that number? I believe it was. Uh, do, 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 do. Well, so, copy, are but, there racial? Yeah. Is there a racial wage gap in addition to the gender wage gap? I think it's between. It's, well, it seems like uh, 
people of color, or apparently the wage gap is even bigger for us. Um, and it's, again, starting with the idea that you are earning less than uh, white males uh, for doing the same work. But when you layer on you know, the, the types of jobs that black women, for example, I'm going to speak as a black woman, the types of jobs that black women go into, what they study, uh, black women are over represented in, in areas like social work and education. When you come out, and I have a lot of friends for whom this is very true in social justice work, they come out with a lot of student loan debt, but their, earning, uh, their, their earnings are much lower. And so over time, that certainly does play out. Um, and, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that you were discriminated immediately. Uh, I, the, the, the data doesn't support that. Are there instances of discrimination? Yeah, I'm not going to say that there isn't. Uh, and I think it's foolhardy to pretend that discrimination does not exist. However, there are things, as we've been talking about, a lot of this is controllable based on the choices that you make. And as a black woman, I chose to go into economics and political science. I love politics, but I also liked how the economy worked. That puts me in a far better position when I'm looking for the type of work that I want to do. I got into policy, I speech writer, all that good stuff. And so I think we have to make a decision and recognize that the decisions that we make, they're going to carry a certain price tag with them. Um, and so, uh, so when I when I hear about the black women's pay gap and I hear that it's all based on gender and race discrimination, I think a lot of it is just a narrative to try to victimize us even further. And then, of course, guess who the savior is? By golly, new laws and government. Well, well, you know what? Uh, there, there. You can, we can go back in time, not that distant, not that far ago, when actually it was government laws that really discriminated against people of color in this country. So, uh, so that's really just kind of how that that gender pay gap for people of color comes into play. Again, can you find the data behind it? No, you really can't. And I think a good question here is, do we care so much about what men versus women or black women versus white men make, or do we care about the choices and the opportunities that are available yes. to them? And so that's what we should really be talking about, is how can we increase opportunities for people who tend to have lower incomes and haven't been able to advance as quickly? And the answer is not something like the Paycheck Fairness Act that would actually backfire, because who's going to be discriminated against with all this lawsuit-happy um, stuff that's in that bill? it's going to be women and minorities. If you're an employer, do you want to hire somebody who will be automatically enrolled in any class action lawsuit that's brought, who's going to be more likely to bring those class action lawsuits as lawyers are mining the data and trying to go and pull people and say, hey, we think you're discriminated against. Come with us. We've got this lawsuit that's going to get you all types of money. You're going to hire people that wouldn't be included in those lawsuits, and that's going to end up hurting women the most, and particularly the women that we're really trying to help, those who have lower incomes because they have less experience, um, mothers who are trying to come back into the workforce after a gap in time. You don't want to hire them if you know that you're going to hire a woman that's going to have a lower price tag on her because companies are comparing these and trying to keep their gender pay scales similar, particularly if you had a law like that passed. Let's talk about um, pay scales. And especially, um, there, are, there are certain work environments, like unionized environments or uh, government uh, environments, where discrimination is really difficult to do, if not impossible, because you have a uniform wage schedule. Everyone with the same title and the same years of experience, seniority, um, gets paid the same. Um, do we see wage gaps in those sectors? And, um, and, and wouldn't laws like the Kamala Harris executive order threat to um, have to certify all corporations' um, compensation schedules lead to these kinds of uh, uniform wage schedules? Would that actually address dis um, discrimination or at least address or, or make the wage gap go away? And what are some of the negative side effects from those? Yes, yeah, so we still see wage gaps in these highly unionized environments where your pay is merely a function of the number of years you've been there and the position you're holding. There is no room for discrimination. Across the government, there's a 13% pay gap. It's entirely attributed to differences in occupations. Um, but having that rigid pay structure where you have less opportunity for advancement is not the situation that federal employees like. Only one out of four federal workers believes that their pay is actually based on the job that they perform. Who wants to work in a job where you get paid regardless of your performance? And then when you have 
colleagues that are sitting there and doing half the job you are but earning the same amount because they have the same title as you. It's not a good work environment. Um, we have another example, a recent Harvard study that looked at the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority. So these are bus drivers in that area. It's a totally unionized environment. Nevertheless, they have an 11 cent pay gap between men and women. It's entirely attributed to women working half as many overtime hours as men and taking almost twice as much unpaid leave through FMLA. So they took 17.5 days on average. And they're largely using this leave um, just to get the schedules they want. It's not the maternity type leave that you're thinking of there. So these are all the choices that women are making. And Massachusetts passed a law to try and reduce that gap that existed. And so they made it more difficult for men to gain the overtime system. And they made it more difficult for women to use FMLA, making it harder to qualify to actually take it. The result was that it hurt women. Um, everybody's wages went down. Pay went down as a whole because there were fewer overtime hours. But the women ended up taking unqualified leave, unpaid leave, but it didn't qualify under an FMLA. And when they do that, they can be terminated. And so as a result, yeah, you've closed the, they pay, closed the pay gap slightly by 2%. But nobody was better off. And women were the worst off. And I think, well, I was just going to say, I mean, flexibility is a huge thing. Uh, women tend to be flexibility maximizers during certain er times of their 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 uh, their career. I, for example, um, I was. Uh, when I started my career, I was young, single, and uh, wanted to make a lot of money. Uh, and so that's really what I what drove my decision making. Uh, when I got pregnant last year, uh, I worked for an organization that, number one, we work remotely, which is fantastic. So I get to work from home and go into to, to do television and radio and write op-eds and all that good stuff from home. But number two, I was also able to negotiate my own um, paid time off. So my employer provided a certain number of weeks of paid time off, but I wanted some more. Uh, and so I, you know, I was able to negotiate to get a, a couple of additional weeks of time off. Uh, I was brought in to do a, a project while I was on paid leave, and I got some more time off. So again, you're making trade-offs. Uh, you're, you're able to both trade-offs, but also be able to negotiate what you need. And that flexibility gets eroded when you have these one-size-fits-all policies. We always talk about one-size-fits-all, but when you talk about paycheck fairness, when you talk about uh, the Family Act, uh, which is the paid leave plan from um, Senator or uh, Chris Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, it is all about one type of leave or one type of pay structure that fits everyone, but nothing fits everyone. We don't all wear the same shoe size, so why should we all have the same pay level, the, pay, the same pay scale? It removes all of the, the controlling factors, the things that make us unique and allow us to have the power to negotiate for what we, we really know that we're worth. Amen. <laughs> I think that's a great point, which is that if you're unhappy with the benefits that are being provided to you at your job, you don't necessarily need a new government policy to correct that for you. You should go and talk to your employer and tell them, I have a little kid and I would like to spend more time with my little kid. Is there any way that you could accommodate that and start at that point? place because what I've seen in the various different places that I've worked is that there's always accommodations made for good workers. I've seen it in every single company that I've worked for. And if you've proven that you do good work, that you work hard, and that you're willing to get the job done, um, then your employer will be flexible with you and will find a way to accommodate your needs. So I think that that's a really key point. Um, and also just wanted to jump into kind of what Rachel was saying about uni unionized pay. There's this interesting story study on Uber, which is also sort of similar in some ways to a union in that there is an algorithm which decides how much you get paid. And there's not in this algorithm any differentiation. It doesn't know. The algorithm is blind towards whether you're a male or female driver. It doesn't even know if you're a male or female driver. So some Stanford researchers and some Uber economists got together and did the study to look at the Uber gender pay gap. And they found that if you just looked at weekly wages between male and female drivers, the pay gap was more than 30%, which is like, wow, that, that must be bad. What's going on there? So then they actually adjusted for hours worked, and they found just from doing that adjustment that it brought that pay gap down to 7%, so considerably less. And then because they had very rich data at Uber, which obviously they don't have, you don't have this type of information about every person's type of work in the economy, but at Uber, there are basically you know, rides that take a certain amount of time and 
are happening at a certain speed and go from point A to point B, and Uber has access to all of that. So they really are able to drill down on kind of employee productivity and preferences and the choices that employees are making. And so they drilled down on that 7% and found that um, there were a few different things that actually explained that 7% remaining pay gap, and none of them were discrimination. They were things like, oh, male drivers tend to drive in different locations than female drivers do by choice. They prefer to drive in these other locations. And um, there were other things too, like male drivers tended to stay on the Uber platform for longer periods of time, and they worked more hours, again, per week. And so what they discovered is that there was a lot of learning by doing, which shouldn't surprise anybody. It's basically the idea that you get better at your job if you do more of your job, and you learn how to do your job better over time. And so that's really what what was reflected in that 7% gap, and there was no discrimination gap um, once you accounted for the things that matter. So if there's one thing that you all take away from this entire discussion, I would hope that it would be that when you hear these big, scary gender pay gap statistics, you automatically think, what would explain that gap? So what characteristics are different between the average male worker and the average female worker that would reconcile that gap? And think about those things and look for studies that actually try to address those things, because that's good economics. On that Uber, I just wanted to also follow up with another study that was done. I mentioned before it's really hard to measure the value of flexibility. Uber has actually been able to do that because of all this rich data they have, and they estimated it to be equal to about 40 to 50 percent of drivers' wages per week. Now, this is a selective group. Um, people who obviously choose Uber want to have that flexibility, but it found that they valued that, you know, on an average $150 per week, and as a result of the flexibility, they actually worked twice as much as they would have if they'd have to chose, choose a taxi cab type structure where you commit to the whole day. And I wanted to talk about that flexibility and just what that means, because I see this as a huge gain in progress that has been made um, and a big reason why women's labor force participation has increased so much over the past decades is because women's desires have brought more flexibility into the workplace. And if we try to close what is really a choice gap by taking those away from women and resulting in really rigid pay structures and one size fits all jobs, you close the door on a lot of women even being able to work. So I'm coming up on school's gonna let out here and four of my children will be home all the time. I mean, we'll have camps and everything, but it gets more tricky then. Mm -hmm. And so it's harder. Four you know, of her office. six children. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder to be in the office. Like if I had a nine to five schedule five days a week and had to conform to that all the time, it would be really difficult. And I would probably just decide to not work anymore. Um, that would be having... a great loss to heritage <laughs> and the conservative movement. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Having that flexibility though, I love staying in the labor force, and I like to do the job that I have, but I also want to have be able to meet the priorities of my family, and that's something that mm -hmm. is only available under the current situation. I think that's so important to realize that in many ways what we're looking at is a choice gap, and that is okay, and we should be able to make those choices. I think I'll have time to take one or two questions um, from the audience if anybody would like a, uh, to raise a question. Um, and um, maybe in a sentence or two for each of you, what advice do you have for young women and men for how they can best position themselves for success in the workplace and to earn their worth? A couple of sentences. Yeah, yeah. I would say, first of all, prove your worth. Um, don't step into a new job demanding all these things. Prove what you're worth, and then from there on, you have a much stronger negotiate, negotiation um, stance going forward. And don't be scared to negotiate. I read a statistic that 53% of men negotiate their salaries compared to 7% of women. Um, there's no reason not to negotiate an offer that you have. So get your foot in the door and then negotiate. negotiate. Uh, don't take no for an answer. If you ask for a raise, your, your first job, and your boss says no, uh, no doesn't mean no forever. It could just be no for right now. And so, you know, if you can prove your worth, you can certainly go back later on, um, or you can ask for greater responsibilities, with which then comes greater um, greater pay. I think these ladies have pretty much covered it. I was going to say something similar, which is that there's this study. It's called the Acting Wife Study, and it surveyed um, different female students that were attending an elite business school. And it asked, so these are career-driven women, and it asked them what 
you know, have you ever done these various, have you ever avoided doing these various helpful behaviors in the workforce because you were actually worried about appearing ambitious or pushy? And it was just completely shocking, the proportion of women that said that they had, and even comparing that to men in the study, um, men sometimes, so for instance, when it comes to negotiating actually your wage or a promotion, 63% um, of these women said that they had not done that, that they had avoided doing that because they were worried about looking ambitious or pushy. And there were men that had also avoided that behavior, but it was like 20, 28%, so it was less than half the amount. And so that kind of shows you what, some, like that, what that gender disparity looks like in the way that men and women are just behaving in the workplace with their employers. So I think certainly making a note of that, that that could be happening, and just the way that that may affect what, it, whether or not you're getting paid your worth, um, and trying to take some proactive steps to overcome that would be a great first step. Culture and so socialization are other issues that we cannot address, maybe through legislation, but through conversations like this one. Yes, agreed. That's another thing. And um, I think we probably haven't spent a lot of time on that, but certainly mm -hmm. there are anecdotal examples galore, you know, women being told that the best thing that you could do is not a job at all. Um, I mean, I know like growing up, one of the messages that I heard is that the best job you can do is to be a mom. So that's not like a workplace job. Now that may be actually true. I mean, I, ha I don't have kids, so it'd be hard for me to say exactly whether or not that's true. Um, but, but that type of messaging is right, a cultural, which some people would consider that a cultural issue. And so if you want to address sort of gender disparities in the workplace, then really you have to actually address those cultural issues. And I don't think that probably most people in this room are super concerned about that issue. But if you're somebody that is on kind of the left of center and you are worried about the gender pay gap broadly, then that's the type of concern that you would want to address. And there's also a movement now in the opposite direction where women who do want to stay home with their children and raise their families feel like they're getting societal pressure to get back to work. So there's all these shifting tides, and in the end, I think we all need to make the decision that's best for us and for our families. Um, the um, uh, Before we conclude, I, I just want to um, thank all of our speakers, and uh, some of them will stick around for lunch, so because we didn't have a chance to ask questions, if you want to come up then and ask a question, please do so. And uh, I would like to invite Michelle uh, back to the stage. Thank you so much for um, hosting us and uh, for the Conservative Women's Network for putting on this, um, this great panel here today. And we have, uh, we have some gifts uh, for you all before we head out for lunch. What an excellent panel. Thank you so much, ladies. And I know some of you are Indians who just arrived in Washington just a day or two ago. And I want to tell you, this is a very special discussion. You've heard four conservative ladies destroying a left-wing myth. <laughs>